Hey girl, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing 30 life lessons that I've learned. I recently turned 30 and honestly, on my birthday, I almost gave into the feeling of feeling like sad whenever I had just had a huge revelation and I had so much to be thankful for. So I decided to pull up my journal and I wrote out 30 things that I had learned over the past years and it really took my mind off of, you know, all of the bad things or the world, the things that I didn't have the lack. Please remember, these are not in any specific order. I'm just going to list them off. Number one is nothing fill your void like God. Honestly, y'all, I grew up in church and I had wandered into the world. I was trying to medicate my brokenness with food, with alcohol, with men. I had even started weed a little bit of pop in prescription medication and even throughout my walk off and on when i would stray away from god i have truly learned that nothing satisfies the emptiness that we feel like our relationship with god god comes in and he cleans everything up and he fills every void that is inside of us and once you taste of him and see that he is so good nothing compares no high no food no instant gratification compares to the true unconditional love of our Heavenly Father. Lesson number two is that we should not only accept good from God, but we should also accept when bad happens. I got this lesson from reading the book of Job. And whenever God allowed the enemy to, sh to strike him and test him, he took his family, he took his possessions, he took everything from him. And when Job's wife was saying, just curse God and die, he told her, silly woman, should we only accept good from the Lord, from God? No, we should not. And that just opened my eyes to God doesn't make bad things happen, but he can allow them. And should we only accept the good things or should we accept the bad things and look at them and ask God, what are you trying to teach me in this? What is the lesson? How can I grow? What are you speaking to me in this season instead of hurrying up and asking God to bring us out of it, to work a miracle and for that season to be up? Number three, this is a very recent lesson that I've learned. And shout out to Melody Alyssa. She has a YouTube channel. I actually went to church with her in Georgia and I'm going to link her channel below. She made a video about like basically honoring the way you feel with friendships or just people in general. And that was such a confirmation for me. So number three is honor the way you feel about people and act accordingly. Uh, I have a one discernment and sometimes it's a blessing and a curse sometimes i don't want to discern things about certain people and because of my relationship with them or the way that i see them the love i have for them i'll push down what i'm discerning and i will drive myself crazy i will say oh it's it's not that deep you're tripping you know but now within the last i would say six five to six months i have been leaning in Y'all, so many people ignore their discernment and those nudges from God when literally discerning spirits and discernment is a spiritual gift. That is a gift from God. And so many people ignore that, but also so many people are praying for discernment. They're praying to be able to discern the spirits and things that are going on. And people who have it like me, some of us are rejecting it, pushing it down, trying to sm snuff out that, that light, that candle, that fire that God is like, you were picking up on something before destruction comes warning. And y'all, so many times I just earned things, but I ignored my discernment, especially when it came to men, when it came to friends, when it came to just people, relationships, I would always push my discernment down but I have decided not anymore. I'm going to lean into that thing and I'm going to ask God, what am I picking up on? And I'm going to move accordingly. I'm, I've learned every time I've ignored my discernment, my discernment was right. What I was picking up on was right. And I learned a lesson that could have been avoided if I would have trusted what I was discerning. Lesson number four that I learned is it's okay not to be okay, but just don't get stuck there. You see, sometimes... Me being the oldest, me just always being the one to have it all together, I would have seasons where I genuinely was not okay. And when people would call and check on me and ask me how I'm doing, even as be believers, we get into this mode where we're like, I'm blessed, I'm good, everything's great. 
and things can be good, but that doesn't mean that they're always good. That doesn't mean that everything is always okay. It's okay to open up to people who you can trust and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm having a really hard time. I'm actually not okay. And to process your feelings and to allow yourself to feel those emotions, but do not get stuck there. There should be an appropriate amount of time that you spend grieving something or processing something, but you should not camp out there and make a home there and stay and let those feelings take over you and become a city whenever it was just a destination on the road that you're traveling on. You shouldn't make a home there. Number five is rejection and loss of relationship does not determine your value. I have dealt with a lot of abandonment, a lot of rejection. I just did a video about a 21 day fast that I did and how God delivered me from the spirit of rejection and a victim mentality. If you have not seen that video, I'm going to link it below and I'll put a little up there. And so you will see that. But I used to always hold on to people in relationships past the expiration date because if they were to try to walk away or if I felt like I needed to walk away, I felt like it spoke to my value, that I didn't have as much value because someone was leaving my life or that I was exp exp expendable, exposable, that I was exposable and that I just didn't have value to that person. But I learned that rejection and loss of relationship is natural and it's also and it's also protection. Relationships are sometimes go through seasons. Sometimes you meet people for a reason, sometimes you meet them for a season, and sometimes people are in your life for a lifetime. And we have to be okay with letting go. If we can't release what's in our hand, God cannot bring more into it. Sometimes I would hold on. And have you ever seen that meme where it's like the rope and it's like it's harder to hold on and it's easier to let go? I really had to learn how to let go of certain relationships that were in my hand. And even if I didn't understand in that moment why and be okay that that was what was meant to happen in that season. Not everything is going to last forever. And you can still have love for those people. When they come to mind, I still pray for them. I still very much love some of the people that I was in relationship with that I no longer in relationship with. But those relationships have come and gone and their season has passed. That's a part of discerning. You have to discern what season you're in, even in relationships, and be okay when they are expired. You, we wouldn't keep food past the expired date and eat on it because we're like, oh no, I don't want to throw it away no you're gonna see the mold you're gonna see the crust on it you're gonna be like ew this is bad it's past the expect expiration date this is not good for me this is not going to serve me i cannot gain nutrients or substance from this i'm not gaining anything from the relationship it is time for me to let it go and that doesn't mean that it says anything about you it could say something about the relationship maybe you're growing and you've outgrown that thing that relationship those people and you no longer fit in there and that is okay Number six also aligns with this and goes with the video that, that I, I just recorded is that you do not have to be a victim. Yes, you may have been victimized. Yes, you may have been done dog dirty and have people do horrible things to you. But you are not responsible for what people did to you. You are responsible for healing. Hurt people hurt people. And anger, resentment, bitterness is a poison that only hurts you. You have to be able to forgive and not necessarily forget because you there are lessons learned from certain situations, but to not be bound by that, to not get stuck there, to say, okay, this happened, but I'm victorious through Christ. Jesus already conquered this on the cross and it is okay. We know that rejection and loss is gonna happen being victimized is gonna happen it happened to jesus if we look at the life of jesus he was rejected by his own people he was spit on he was hunted down he was arrested falsely accused all the things that may happen in our inner circles in our families and in our lives people saying intentions about us that we really don't have us being misunderstood our intentions being twisted those things all happen to jesus and whenever that happens we don't have to take a victim mentality we can lean into the life of christ open our bible and, and learn about everything that he did and how he handled the situations even whenever pilate was questioning him jesus didn't say anything he said maybe like two or three words 
He did not defend himself. The battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. And when we walk around with a victim mentality, we have a chip on our shoulder and we're always trying to advocate for ourselves and prove something to ourselves. And y'all coming out of that, it is exhausting. It is time to be free and let God be your defender. Number seven is that therapy is nothing to be ashamed of. I know personally being in the African American community and sometimes in the church community, therapy can be looked at as something wrong. I'll never forget in one of my darkest seasons, my friend told me, you need help. You need to talk to someone. And I remember crying like, oh, she said, I need help. Oh, I need help. I'm crazy. And even whenever I signed up for the free counseling at the church that I now go to, you didn't even have to be a member. But in my mind, I already blocked off. That's off limits. I'm not going to talk about that because I don't want them to think I'm crazy. I don't want to, them to think something's wrong with me. So I'm only going to allow myself to get partial healing. I'm only going to allow myself to talk about certain things, but not go into the deep, nitty gritty, the nasty, dirty things, because what will they think about me? And the more I started to go to church before my sessions, I realized, no, I need help. She's right. I need help. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You can only be as healed as you want to be. You can only be as free as you want to be. Because the Bible tells us, then you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. We know the truth that is in Christ and in the gospel, but it can only set us free when we allow it to set us free. So a lot of times because of certain stigmas and things that are put on to getting help and therapy or even people who have to take medication, we reject a level of freedom that God wants to bring to us. Those things are not the healer, but they can be used as tools to heal. And what a trick of the enemy to make us reject another level of healing, to make us reject something that's going to peel off layers of abuse, of deception, of morph self-identity, body dysmorphia, all these things that have happened on family secrets, generational curses. Versus. Of course, he doesn't want us to get healing. So I wouldn't even put that on man. That is of the enemy. That is of the enemy to make us ashamed. I will never forget one of my young adults pastors. He said, no, when we talk about the things that happen to us and we get healing, it is not shame on you for releasing it. It is shame off of you. That was so freeing to me. So if you feel like you need help, you need to talk to someone before this year is over, go get that thing. Let it be shame off of you, not shame on you. God has so much for you. The Bible says faith without works is dead. So you have to have faith that you're going to be healed, but then you may have to do the work and go talk to someone. Number eight, oh, y'all, this one is so good. It's that I didn't have to earn God's love. It was already there for me. When you are struggling with the spirit of rejection and a victim mentality and even abandonment, it really makes way for things, especially if you have a very unhealthy upbringing for codependency and you begin to trade affection for action. You think that that's where your value comes from. And I really brought that into my relationship with God because of course we spend more time with man. We were birthed into an a world with society and human beings. So we are formed, our ideologies, our patterns, a lot of things are formed from the relationships around us and just culture in general. And that's why we are born again when we accept Christ and we are adopted into the family of God. And one thing that I really struggled with was performing. And that's a part of perfectionism. It's just trying to be perfect for God and trying to do these things so I could be seen as good and cleaned up and worthy. And the greatest revelation that I received was that you're already worth it. The greatest thing that God could have ever did for us was salvation. And it was free. It says that while we were yet still sinners, while we were yet still in love with our sin, yet Christ still chose to die for us. We didn't have to have it all together to be worthy of salvation, to be worthy of the sacrifice of his life. You and I are worth a life even when he knew we were going to choose our sin over him a thousand times. How many times have some of us been delivered for something and ran back to it? I'm speaking for myself. I'm not judging. But God knew we were going to do that. And he still said we were worthy. He didn't say 
You have to clean it up. You have to look this way. You have to be perfect because God and Jesus are so compassionate. The same very people he died for spit in his face. We're laughing at him. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do because he has so much compassion and love for them. So if you are struggling, feeling like you have to earn God's love, you have to perform. You have to be perfect. You have to be the cookie cutter Christian wash that off of you right now you are already worthy you were already chosen and he chose you before you ever chose him you didn't choose god god chose you before you were ever formed in your mother's womb god knew you he has a plan for you you're coming into agreement with it now and you're walking this thing out but god already chose you rest in that and receive it you were chosen you were loved so as y'all know i am on a health journey and number nine has really been something that i've learned on this journey is that my value is not determined by the scale y'all i haven't really done a health update but i am not weighing myself i joined weight watchers and i'll make an official video about that i just had my first month being on weight watchers and one thing that i realized is that when i would weigh myself i would self-sabotage and how much it would mess with my psyche i would say i worked out five days and i did everything and i only lost two pounds only and even when i would try to encourage myself and stir myself up and say oh well at least i lost two pounds at least i didn't gain I'm gonna be honest, it still didn't work. Y'all, I was mad. I wanted to lose four pounds a, a week, even though my goal was one to two pounds. Of course, you see these videos online that say, I lost 20 pounds in two weeks and how I lost 15 pounds in 15 days. And you know, I would get on the scale and every time I would see the number, even if it was just a little bit lower, I still would feel my self-worth and my value go down and that, showed that my weight was an idol because my value was set in Christ. My value was set on Calvary. The price has been paid. My value does not come from my weight, from my skin, from my hair, from anything but from Jesus Christ. Number 10, I learned from my papa. How many of y'all have had your grandparents tell you something and when you're younger, you're kind of like, okay, okay yeah 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 i hear you but then once you get into the world and you start living you start realizing okay papa knows a thing or two so number 10 papa taught me that men all they have is their word and if a man cannot keep his word then he does not have character and he is not worth nothing and to not be romantically involved with a man or to give them the time of day if they can't even honor their commitments or their word so y'all I used to dating I used to make so many excuses for people and acting out of low self-worth low self-value no self-identity I put up with so much stuff from men and now a part of discerning and leaning into what I'm feeling is also realizing that if you cannot keep your word to me that's a character thing you know especially if we are believers we are to give an honest yes and an honest no and anything other than that is from the enemy but we should not give our word and not keep it number 11 is people do not see you the way you see yourself I remember when I was in Atlanta, I was reading this book called Codependent No More. And there was an exercise where you were to reach out to at least three to four people. And you asked them what were their initial thoughts about you when they met you. And I wrote down what I thought they would say. Oh, she's plus size. Oh, she's this. She's nice, but this. And honestly, when I received the messages back from the people that I asked, it was so eye-opening that the things that I were worried about, that wasn't even on their mind. They complimented my smile and, you know, just other things about me. And I was like, wow, the things that we feel insecure about, they're magnified in our minds. And when we have these initial, um, when we have these initial interactions with people in our mind certain narratives are just playing in our head and that is not how people were receiving me and it was so freeing to actually write down what i believed they were going to say their perceived initial um their perceived initial thoughts of me to compare it to what they actually said it was so freeing so know that 
the voice, those taunting spirits, those lying spirits, they're of the devil. He's a liar and the truth is not in him. But people do not see you the way that you see yourself, especially people who are in relationship with Christ and they love God and they see you the way that God does. You have to ask for the eyes of Christ, for the mind of Christ, especially regarding yourselves. So many times we pray to love people like Christ, but do we pray to love ourselves like Christ loves us? Do we pray to see ourselves the way that God sees us? We need to start to. Number 12 is hurt people truly do hurt people. There were certain people that I had interactions with and I got wounded in those interactions. And I took that one and I began to make assumptions about their character and who they were in certain narratives. And oh, they abused me and they, they were looking for those opportunities. They preyed on me. And sometimes, yeah, that does happen. But when God began to change my heart for these people, especially people in my family, and I asked God to give me a glimpse of their childhood, I weeped for them. I became sad for them. The things that I saw really put things into perspective and it made my heart change for them. And I was able now, and even then, I'm able to pray for them and to love them a lot different. A lot of the times we think it's just about us. Yes, there are some demons on people that are irritated by your spirit, but a lot of times it's the way that people feel about themselves. It's the things that people are going through personally and they're hurting and they lash out. They're sick and they lash out and we have to give them grace and we have to ask for God to give us a glimpse of maybe what that person is dealing with or maybe what they've dealt with throughout their lifetime and how we can love them and how we need to have boundaries and let God set those things and not us set them out of a place of anger and resentment. Number 13 is God does not make mistakes. Many times things would happen and I would say, oh, it didn't turn out the way that I thought it was. This was a waste. This was a mistake. But God turns all things for our good. Those who are called according to his purposes and we are in relationship with him, he will use everything for our good. He does not make any mistakes. He is perfect and he is good. Number 14 is that on your Christian walk, you will have ups and downs. A lot of times, Christian influencers, people in the local church, they make it seem like it's all rainbows and sunshine and unicorns. And there is no problems with Christ. You are gonna have it all, name it and claim it. There is no poverty, there is no sickness. That is not God's portion for you. And yes, God wants us to thrive and yes, God wants good things for us, but we also live in a fallen world. And because the closest person to me, who was my grandma, was an actual real, real woman of God. Like when I think about a Christian, a woman of God, I think about my grandma, she passed away before I ever became saved. She passed away when I was 18. I got saved at 24, about to be 25. And I didn't have her as a direct counsel, as, as wise counsel. I had memories of her and things I saw her do with her life, but I didn't see the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows in her relationship with Christ. So sometimes I didn't know that you'll go through times where you don't hear God. You'll feel him. Sometimes you may not feel him or hear him, but he is still there. I had to learn through time. My relationship with God has been tested. It's gone through different seasons and it's like any other relationship. But I will tell you that your relationship with God sets the tone for every other relationship in your life. But you have to know that there is ups and downs and are you gonna be long suffering with Christ? Are you gonna be long suffering with God? Are you only gonna leave the first time he doesn't give you what you want or what you perceive was good? The Bible tells us that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So sometimes we think something is good but it's not kingdom. It's not God. He knows. We have to trust that no one on this earth, not our mothers, not our friends, not our sisters, no one loves us more than God. And he is working everything for our good. And that even in the valley, he will be there. Our church has an original song. It's called God is Always Good. And it says, what I sing on the mountain, I'll sing in the valley. God is always good. And they came out with that song when I first came to the church in 2017. And it just so blessed me. What I'll sing on the mountain, I will sing in the valley. God is always good. Through the ups and downs of my relationship with God, he never changes. I change. I go through the ups and downs and I'm feeling them and I get frustrated. And, you know, he does not change. He has never changed. He's the same God. He was thousands of years ago. We serve the same God.
Number 15 is God never left me. Growing up, I went through a lot of abuse, both mental, emotional, sexual, and I always felt like, why did these things happen to me? I was just a kid. Why would God allow this to happen to me? But then a part of me knew it was happening for a reason that there was going to be such a purpose that would come from it and that it wasn't for me. Even when I was six years old, I knew it wasn't for me. It was for other people. But a small part of me felt like, God, why did you leave me? And I remember God telling me, I never left you. I was there with you the whole time. And even you can ask God to show you where he was at in those moments. I just had a friend do this and she said that she went back to a very traumatic incident that happened to her and she saw god walking with her and her siblings throughout this this encounter this incident that happened and she saw god around them and she saw where he was but she felt in that moment they were abandoned that they were forsaken and she asked god where were you and he showed himself it is so important if you have any lingering issues in your heart to where you still feel like God abandoned you and you left him, that you take it to him and you ask him, where was he? Do not fake it. Do not act like everything is fine. God wants relationship with you. He wants healing for you. He wants breakthrough for you. And that comes with authenticity and transparency. And you have to be able to be transparent with God and say, I have some questions. There's some things that happened. Where were you? God can handle it. He can take it and so can you. It's time for us to start doing the hard thing. We don't have to have a surface relationship with God. God wants to call us into the deep. This is the time to go deeper in him. Lesson number 16 I learned from the book I'm reading right now with my small group, Kingdom Women, and it is to know the season you are in and to act accordingly. A lot of times we don't even stop and try to discern or ask God, what season are we in? And we find ourselves striving and exhausted because we are doing things out of season. A kingdom woman knows what season she's in and she moves accordingly. Everything is scheduled and according to what season she is in. She doesn't do things out of season because there is a time for reaping. There is a time for sowing. There is a time for harvest and there is a time to prepare and to store up. And so we have to know what season we are in. We always should be consulting God. That way we are acting accordingly. There's a reason why you're serving at all these different ministries. You're feeling exhausted. You're not gaining anything. You look at your life and there's no fruit because it's, maybe it's not the season for you to be serving. And that is okay. Sometimes certain churches don't make it seem like it's okay not to serve. Maybe it's a season to sit down, take out your notebook and to learn. Maybe it's a season to glean to get under mentorship. But we think, oh, it's a season to start my ministry. It's a season to start getting, trying to be a leader in church. It's a season to start trying to make a name for myself. It's a season to start volunteering. You can even do that with good intentions. Every church I would go to, I would join the children's ministry. And God had to tell me for a season, you are wounded. You went through some things. Sit down and get healing glean eat from the meal i'm preparing at this table at this church it's not a season to serve and it took everything out of me not to do it but it's dangerous to be outside of the will of god even if it's perceived good it still is dangerous number 18 is to give an honest yes and a no the bible tells us that let your yes be your yes and your no be your no anything other than that is from the evil one do not give in to peer pressure to people pleasing that is not of god give an honest yes and give an honest no you have to break free from the fear of man and that's where a lot of this comes from is fear of perceived rejection and that was for me i got myself in a lot of dangerous situations with men because i was too afraid to say no i knew i didn't want to do certain things i know i didn't want to go to certain places and i was so afraid of rejection that i would say yes and that was from the enemy, that that pressure. That is not from God. That is not from God. Even if you feel convicted to not do things that your other Christian friends do. Okay, that's fine. Give a yes and give an honest no. Don't agree to serve. Don't agree to do anything because you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Because then you become resentment to other people. And the person you need to look at is the person in the mirror. And that's who you're going to end up being resentful towards. Because you're like, I always do this. I always overextend myself. It's because you may want validation. 
always let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. And when you find yourself in seasons overextending yourself, always ask yourself, why am I doing this? Take a look at the root. Number 18 is you can do hard things. A lot, a lot of times we find ourselves in situations that are very comfortable, but not necessarily good for us or healthy. And the hard thing is to end that relationship or to walk away from that ministry or to close that door and walk away from that job even. And we tell ourselves, I can't do it. But you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If God is telling you to do that thing, walk in obedience and do it. I'm here to tell you one of the lessons that I learned, I used to see myself as so frail and so weak, but no, I am victorious through Christ. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. I never thought I would have the strength to walk away from a man, from a relationship that didn't serve me. I would pray for them to leave me. I would pray for God to send them away. And one day I just heard God like, you do it. You see that it's not working. You, you walk away, you can do it. You tell them goodbye. And for the first time ever, really, I I was able to walk away from a man. I, I still loved him. I still had feelings for him, but I knew it wasn't God's will for me. And I had to say bye because I was like, I can do hard things. Greater is he that is within me than he that is in this world. You got to stir yourself up in the word. Encourage yourself and say, I can do all things through Christ. And it wasn't till I did it, scared, trembling, afraid, that I was able to prove and show myself that I can do it. It doesn't mean it won't be hard. It doesn't mean it won't be scary, but I can do it. And you can too. Lean into Christ. It's not within my strength. It is his strength. When we are weak, then his strength is made perfect. Then his power is made perfect. So I, I had to lean in him in vulnerability and say, I don't know if I can do this, but I need your help. If you're telling me to say it, if you're telling me to end it, if you're telling me to walk away, for me to close the door, God strengthen me to do it. And he will be faithful to do it. He's not a respecter of man. He will do it for you. Lesson number 19 I had to learn was that God is a provider. Y'all, because I went through so much growing up, I didn't really trust God. I was like, as long as I'm healthy and I can work, baby, I'm going to go to work. Not even not even healthy. I'm going to work sick because what I'm not going to do is call out. I will not depend on nobody to pay these bills. I will never ask nobody for help. You won't catch me doing it. I'm the one that people ask for help. I don't ask for help. Not out of a pride thing, but I never really had nobody that I could really depend on, you know, consistently. And when I first got saved, y'all, my job laid off all 300 employees. And God told me like maybe 20 minutes before it happened, God told me it was going to happen and that I needed to be okay. And that he was going to make it so I can get unemployment, so I could focus on school. And I was like, unemployment? I'll go work. I'll go get a job. And God said, no, this is how the provision is coming. And I had to be okay with that. God would have people write me checks, $900, $200. And it was so foreign to me, but he provided. I had to go through seasons where he was my provider. Even when I lived in Atlanta, I lived with an amazing family and I had to use their car. I had to live in their home. And it was so foreign to me. I'm used to people living with me. I never had to live with people and they're paying for my groceries. They're paying for everything and I'm using their transportation. Sometimes I wouldn't even leave the house. I would get invited to do things because it was just so like, I don't even want to ask. I'm not used to that. But God said, hey, you came here to serve and you didn't have to pay to ship your car all the way here. Give it to your sister. I'm providing for you. Transportation, everything you need is provided for. Number 20, if I said 20 last time, this is 21, is I kind of touched on it, but it is that do things afraid. Y'all, I don't really listen to T.D. Jakes no more and I grew up going to the Potter's house, but there's this video, this interview with him and Stephen Furtick I don't listen to neither one of them no more. But it was when he made the book Crushing and he said something that honestly I have never forgotten. This was probably like four or five years ago. He said, if there's something that God is telling you to do, you feel you need to do, do it afraid, do it trembling, do it shaking. Because at the end of your life, you don't want to look back and say, what would have happened if I would have did that? 
Where would my life be? Where would I have been? You don't want to stand before God. And he said, I told you to do that thing. Now look at all the souls that were tied to that. And you were too scared to do it. Do that thing afraid. Do it trembling. But whatever God is telling you to do, whatever you know you're supposed to do, do it. Number, we're going to say 21. Number 21 is break up with comfort. You cannot grow where you were comfortable. You know, one thing for me is, I used to always walk around and look so miserable. And I used to like go out with my sisters and I would be like, oh, nobody approaches me. Not even like female, like females. I would try to make friends. And my sister's like, you look uncomfortable. You look physically uncomfortable in your own skin. And it wasn't until I got saved that God called me to do things. Like even being on YouTube, y'all, I cringe. I tried not to even look into the camera too much or I won't do it. I do things that make me uncomfortable. Before I used to run away from them, now I run towards them. As someone who never felt comfortable in their own skin, never felt comfortable being themselves, I have to get uncomfortable to become comfortable. I had to break up with comfortability because I saw what that got me, staying small and living a shell of the life God had for me. I had to leave that. Number 22 is open and closed doors that whole concept of oh if this is an open door it's from god if it's a closed door it's not from god is not biblical this was a very recent lesson that god taught me from my pastor and she she spoke on this yes the bible says that god opens doors that no man can close and that he shuts doors no man can open but he also says to ask seek and knock and how many times do we dismiss something as a closed door because we're not discerning a not right now from a flat out no we're not knocking at the door to receive the breakthrough, to receive the thing God has for us. We knock and then we say, oh, that wasn't God's will. Okay, I don't want it anyways if it's not God's will, which we, we're doing that with good intentions. But I wonder how many things we haven't received that God truly had for us because of that concept, how that's crept into the church. We think things are always supposed to be easy. You know, one analogy she used, she said that any place I go to where the doors open, they're trying to sell me something. Yes, hospital and things like that, those doors open and that can be a place of healing. Shopping stores, malls, all those type of places, those doors automatically open. It's easy. There's always a trade, a currency. It's not free. So how many doors are we expecting to just be like automatic doors? And, oh, that's God's will. That can deceive you too. You could walk into a door that's an automatic door that's trying to take something from you. That's trying to have you barter something. That's going to have you compromise and sell and trade something that God never wanted you to because it looked like an open door. We have to ask his will, seek his will, and then knock on the door to see if he's going to open up that door if it's his will. And stand there long enough to see if somebody's going to come to the door. We don't just bang on the door and leave. We knock. We listen. We try to see if somebody's home. Is anybody there? Y'all, that revelation was so freeing to me. Number 23 is gratitude makes a difference. I've gone through seasons of depression, of deep, immense sadness. And when I tell you that was because I was looking at the situation. I was looking at the storm. I was looking at the water. And I wasn't looking to Christ. I wasn't reminding myself of things to be thankful for, things he's done past seasons of his faithfulness and just acting in gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. You, this may not be working out for me right now, but I know you've done it and you'll do it again. Gratitude makes the difference in your life. When you lead, when you lead a life of gratitude, you have so much more peace and so much more happiness because you're not always with your hand out looking for things and disappointed when it doesn't get something in it you're handing those things out you're handing out grace because you're so grateful that you freely received grace you're handing out love because you so freely received love your whole countenance changes whenever you lead from a place of gratitude number 24 is be authentically you there is only one you i had to learn this so many times I would dim myself down, my personality, my fire for God, because it was too much. And I was afraid of rejection and how people would perceive me. And, the, and people did reject me. People told me I was a Mother Teresa or I thought I was too good. I was holier than thou. But 
Y'all, if I was a mess for the, the devil, if I was jumping out of cars, twerking at red lights, at the club, doing all that, I was show about to turn up for Jesus. I was show about to turn up for God. I, I showed out for the devil, so I'm show about to turn out for God. Sometimes people, they don't understand why you're so intense. With me, it was like, because of how intense I used to be for the things of the devil, how reckless I was with my mouth, how reckless I was with my life. It's not that I think I'm so holy. I can't do certain things because I know how wicked my heart used to is. I'm not used to be, almost so used to be, how it really is. So it's just like, oh, you're that's too deep. It's not that it's not that deep for you. But for me, I can't listen to Janae, to Kaylani to all these things because my heart will be like oh we haven't heard that song in a long time it'll start to stir emotions certain spirits will come on i can't do that and not everybody has that revelation it's okay but what i will no longer do is dim my light and put myself in a box and be a shell of myself to make somebody else feel comfortable that is not the life that god called for me and that is not the life god called for you and if people around you don't receive you for who you are get from around them I'd rather be alone and be loved and accepted by God and God be pleased with me than surround myself with people that I have to change and conform for anyways. I'd rather be alone. Pastor Keon Henderson, I watched a video from him years ago, like 2017. He said, if people can't handle you at 100 degrees, don't turn yourself down. Don't turn yourself down. Turn yourself up. Keep, keep, keep it there. Don't, do not turn yourself down for other people. All you need to worry about is how God sees you and pray for people who see you the way that he does to come into your life. So much misery and a, a lot of my self-identity issues came from surrounding myself around the wrong people and wanting validation from people. I wanna be validated by God. I wanna be accepted by God. And I already am. And so are you. So it's time to be your authentic self because we already talked about that. You're already chosen. You're already selected. You are already loved just the way you are. So why would you change yourself? There's no one like you. You are a custom creation. And this kind of leads into number 26. Number 26 is pray without ceasing. Y'all, even when you're struggling with how you feel about yourself, how you see yourself, people around you, just life in general, pray without ceasing. A lot of our like grandmothers in the past generations, they were some prayer warriors. They would be on the floor for hours praying, fasting. Our generation, it's, it's instant gratification because of our phones, because of social media. We want it now. We, we want that popcorn fade. No. Pray without ceasing. You don't have to birth something. Pray that thing through. See it through. This is the time where we are tightest to women. Proverbs 31 women. Pray without ceasing. Lean in. Continue to pray. Because this goes into number 26. God's timing is not our timing. Sometimes we have to pray through certain seasons. We may not see something manifest. But we need to discern, is God asking me to rest? Is he asking me to pray? But know that his timing is not our timing. We'll walk away from something because it's, it's not the time and we haven't discerned the timing. We got the timing off. We're three months early. We're two years early and we're it's not manifesting. And we're saying, God, you promised me this. You told me this. I'm so frustrated. You let me down, God. But did we ask, is this the season? Is this the season to receive? Is this a season to prepare? God, what season are we in? So when we receive a revelation, a word, anything, we must remember that God's timing is not our timing. And if we think it's a word that has a time frame on it, we should always take it back to God. Number 27 is warning comes before destruction. And you'll notice a lot of these kind of layer on top of each other. Y'all, this lesson really when I learned warning comes from destruction it really came from not listening to my discernment God was using discernment to warn me about certain people places things and he would even warn me and I would be like oh no that's that's I'm tripping I didn't hear that I'm not perceiving that I didn't even have a vision of that i my eyes are tricking myself I can't I can't believe my eyes but every time God was trying to warn me before things happened and then when it happened and I'm the one who ignored it I was mad at him 
I was disappointed. I was like, God, why'd you do this? He's like, hello, I told you. I tried to nudge you. I tried to warn you that destruction, hey, destruction is coming. But the greatest, one of the greatest lies of the enemy is that we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust God fully because if we did, when we started discerning things, we wouldn't even be like, this is me. We would be like, God, I trust you. You must be showing me something. Okay, God, I see you. I see you, Lord. And I'm about to take note and I'm about to move accordingly. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I see what you're doing. But, but we have to ask ourselves, why don't we really trust him? What lies do we believe? That's how Eve was so easily to be deceived. And God warned them not to eat the fruit. But they still did it. And then destruction entered the whole world. Into, entered into mankind. Curses. And it's because we don't really believe him. And we, and we don't listen and heed the warnings. It's because we don't believe him. Because we have to be honest with ourselves. Do we really believe God is good? Do we really believe that he is true, that he will keep his word? And that goes into number 28. God keeps his word. I had to learn that he is not a man, that he shall lie. I had to get really, really honest with God and say, every man I've known, a lot of men in my life have lied to me. They've abused me. They've used me. And I don't want to put that on you, God. But I need you to show me who you are. And you have to not charge God for what flawed man has done. Again, look at Jesus. He was dying for humanity and they were spitting in his face. Couldn't be me. But that's why he's our savior. That's why we need a savior. You need to take these things up to God. And all of these lessons that I learned, they all like build on each other and go with each other. Be authentic with God. Be real, be raw. Be transparent and tell him, I don't, I struggle to believe that you're good. I struggle to believe that you're going to keep your word. Show me you'll keep your word. You gave me promises, God. No word that you speak should return void. It won't. You say that in your word, God. Show me. And if I'm off on the timing or anything else, reveal it to me, God. Reveal it to me, Lord. Because I don't want delayed gratification to make my heart get sick. I don't want the slowness as I receive slowness. And God is not slow as we receive slow. And something manifests to put a damper between our relationship. We have to stop. Yes, we should have reverence for God and realize that he is a holy father. But more than anything, he is a father and he wants relationship with you. And it's time that all the things that have crept in and created voids in your relationship, that those things get patched up. Because whether you believe it or not, he is good. He wants to show you himself. Ask him to show you because everything works for your good. I have a tattoo on my arm right here. It's Genesis 50, 20. And this is the verse for my life. And this goes into number 29. God uses everything, our mistakes, our triumphs, our wins, everything for his purpose, for his good. In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph is talking to his brothers. After they realize he's made it, he's second in command. They fall to his feet and they begin to beg him for mercy. They ask him to make him them slaves. And he says, no, 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 I'm not mad at you. You meant to harm me. Yes, you meant to harm me. But God, God meant it for the good to accomplish what is being done now, the savings of many lives. And I put this on me because I believe that all the things that happened to me throughout my life, some people genuinely meant to harm me. Some people were being used by the enemy and they didn't know. Some people were acting out of their brokenness. But that I want it all to be used for God's good. I'll, I'll never not share about my mistakes, my highs, my lows, because I want it to be for the glory of God. If it's worth blessing somebody else and they get a level of freedom and chains come off of them and they grow deeper in relationship with God, then my pain is worth it. It is worth it to make mistakes, 
to not make mistakes, whatever happens. I'm not, I'm never going to hold anything back and lie and cover it up and try to look cookie cutter clean because I want someone else to not have to make the same mistakes that I've made or to go down a path that I've gone down to save someone from a heartache or anything because yes, God has used it all for his good, but what a greater purpose to be able to serve someone else with that. And I want to challenge you to look at your life. How can the things that you've been through, the things that have happened to you, been used as a tool to bless someone else? And this leads into number 30. Not only does everything work out for his good, but there's purpose in pain. A lot of times I couldn't process my pain. I would run from my pain. I didn't know how to properly grieve. And now I'm working with my therapist to learn how to grieve, how to process my emotions, how to allow myself to feel the things that I feel and not suppress it. And there's purpose in that pain. There's lessons. Even healing comes from pain. God prunes trees. If we were living organisms and we could, we are living organisms, if one of our limbs got cut off, it would hurt. We don't know if it hurts the tree, but the pruning is good for it. There's a purpose for it. Not everything that hurts us was meant to harm us. We need to begin to look at our situations, our past hurts, our past pains and say, God, what is the purpose for this? How can this be used for your glory? It's time to not walk around as victims but to walk as victors. And I believe that there's a whole new season that God is ushering in and that he's bringing us into new levels, new depths of him. And it's gonna take us to places we never imagined. And these life lessons that I've learned have really brought me to the moments that I'm at now, to where I've received so much clarity and healing. Yes, I'm not perfect and I still have things that I'm working out with fear and trembling, but I'm not where I used to be. And I pray, I pray that these lessons bless you, that there's something that you can take away from this. If you made it to the end, you know what I'm saying? You're a real one, cause you know my videos can be long, but I don't want to subscribe to keeping it short. I want it to be meaty. I want you to get what God puts on my heart for you to get from this. And so if anything blessed you, if there's anything that stuck out, or if you have a word for me, for anybody in the comments, please just leave it down below. I love talking with y'all. I love seeing y'all's comments. Honestly, like I said, I die every time I get on this camera and seeing, I don't want to get emotional, seeing the things that y'all say and how especially when I hear how my transparency blesses y'all it makes it all worth it I really appreciate every last one of y'all and I love y'all and if you're new here join our becoming fam we are women that are chasing after Jesus to become everything he destined us to be and this is the time to become become everything he envisioned you to be no more living small operating out of brokenness sadness God has so much more for you. Healing is already available to you. So I love you and I will see you in the next one. Bye.